there was a gentleman um, like that. He was 71 in, uh, I think 71 in Kenya just recently, a couple of weeks ago. He had, he had an arm that was paralyzed and his legs both got scalded, burnt severely. But because he had no money, he couldn't get treatment and it started rotting all the way into the bone. But the suffering they go through and until someone's there to help. And same with the children in the orphanages, just knowing that somebody cares, that somebody's there for them. Yep. Like there's one, one of our children's homes, they have about a hundred children and it's an older lady who's blind. She and her husband have this mud home. They have a couple of little mud homes on this plot of land and they have given this land to kids that had no place to live. And so they're, they're packed head to feet on the floor by the rice and beans, you know, on the, on the floor, just trying to scrunch them in to get them a place to lay on their mud floor. There was, there was a young boy in Uganda. He was about an 11 year old. They were playing, the kids were playing and he fell out of a tree. Now these kids are not nutrition, you know, they don't have the nutrition to be strong. They called me up. He was in the hospital, but the doctors wouldn't do anything. And while I was on the phone, he died. <laughs> but I don't want to miss any of the good stuff either, you know, so. I know. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I'll just introduce you by saying welcome to the Entrepreneurial Odyssey <laughs> podcast. Um, my name is Rob Ratliff, and this is Lori Lundeen, and we are here to talk about her foundation, which is the Lori Lundeen Foundation, right? Perfect, yes. <laughs> so cool. We have been trying to get on this podcast for a while, and it just seems like something that's always come up, but man, is this important. We really need to cover this stuff. So yeah, I'm excited that you're here <clears throat> and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So... Um, why don't you just start by telling, telling us a little bit about what it is that you do, what is your foundation, and how did you, well, let's not, let's not start too much. Start with what is your foundation, what do you do, and then we'll backtrack and start talking about how it got started and all that fun stuff. Okay, we we'll go through the story. Um, so the foundation, the Lori Lundeen Foundation, is a global nonprofit organization. It's a 501c3. And we serve people all over the world who are in need. So um, our tagline is bringing nations together in service, unity, and love. And our process is different than any other organization. I don't know of any other one that is like ours. It is reaching out to the one in their unique need, serving individuals, families, organizations, helping meet that need, and then helping them become self-reliant and get unstuck and, and want to give back. And so what we're doing is we're bringing people out of poverty. We're helping them um, get unstuck from their situation, whether it's medical or food or whatever it might be, right? Whatever their needs are. And then we help them get to a point where they can start sustaining for themselves and having hope and light in their life. And then what normally follows is they want to join us and be a part of the giving and sharing and it's bringing the nations together that way. We're currently in six countries, and I've got, now it's over 25 countries with connections ready to open service. I could start serving in any of those um, whenever we're able to expand into them. So uh, all around the world, uh, the globe, all around the globe. So it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. We, we've, you know, we've taken care of um, medical needs. We've taken care of food, water, clothing, school supplies, school fees. We've rescued from natural disasters. Um, we have buried, we've provided burials, which I'll go more into in, in a little while, but we've taken people from the slums, helped them get in apartments and create a business so they can sustain themselves. We're building large projects, things like libraries and learning centers, training centers, um, orphanages, uh, garden spaces, agricultural farms. Um, those are things that we're working towards. And so there's a lot of different things. And, and then in the States, of course, we do serve the veterans and the homeless and the school systems and we're going to be working with foster kids and doing different types of needs depending upon what country it is there's there's just a variety of things that we get to do so beautiful yeah that's it's really unique i you know i obviously have talked to you in the past and know a lot about more about what you do so 
for me, it's, you know, when you're talking about these different things, but for those who are kind of tuning in and learning more about you here, I think it's important that we look at maybe some of the uh, background we'll start with, and then let's, I would love to, after that, we'll kind of dive into what are some of the particular things you've done for individuals and so we can look at exactly how impactful, because I feel like a lot of nonprofits out there, they, you know, we service people in this area and, it, and it's like, okay, I understand that, but it's hard to relate until you really tell a specific story about a specific individual that you impacted and how you impacted them and how you helped them. And I think that's huge. So we'll get into that, but right now let's, uh, let's go back and just talk a little bit about what was your inspiration for starting it and how did you get started? Because I think that's a really interesting story. I, I love it. So I want other people to hear about it. Shall I go from the beginning? <laughs> Absolutely. So as you know, um, Rob, my background is music and theater. I have a master's degree in conducting. I've performed Carnegie Hall, Notre Dame. I conduct in the Bay Area here in California, orchestras, choirs, all kinds of things. And I've been a teacher of performing arts for 16 years. I, I taught every, every course there is in music and every course there is in theater. I've done it. And I've done all ages from kindergarten up to 12th grade. And then working in the community and churches, I've done all ages. So um, it's been an incredible journey. And that really, I felt like that was my path and my calling. And um, I hit a point in 2012 where I was diagnosed with an incurable illness. And I was given nine pills a day for the rest of my life. And I was told by the doctors that no matter what I did, it wouldn't make any difference. I would never get off the medication and I should never try. So I began studying while I was a teacher full time. And I learned that people with my illness were dying, had chemotherapy, some had their gut removed through surgeries. And I just like, I, I have to find a different path. <laughs> None of those options were good to me, you know, and I sound good. No, no, it wasn't good. And it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. And so I began to study and dive into health and wellness while I was still a full-time performing arts teacher, which became very busy. But I, in that process, I became a board certified health coach, a life coach, which I call an optimal life designer and a certified essential oil coach. That was through this journey that I've been on. Right. And, and I've been off all medications for over 11 years. Wow. So I was able to heal from an incurable illness mm -hmm. naturally. And I was able to find the cause of an illness that had no known cause, which it's just been a, an incredible journey. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. And it's been a pivotal moment for me and my life. So while I was in that journey and I was managing everything, you know, my symptoms, I was managing it all naturally. I was off all the medications for a few years. And in 2018, I hit a point in my career where it was becoming really stressful as a teacher. Um, performing arts teachers don't have any free time. <laughs> There's no time freedom. Um, you've got classes all day. You've got rehearsals. You've got performances. It, it really is consuming of your time, which I loved it. Loved it, loved it, but it was time consuming. And I knew that in order to heal and with the stress I was dealing with in, in work environment for teachers, um, I knew something was gonna have to shift. And then at the same time, my mother's health was spiraling very quickly. She was 90 and I knew I had very little time left and I would need to help care for her. So I knew there was gonna have to be a change. And I went to a, it was an international association of women's meetings that I would attend. and. We had a guest speaker and he came and he was offering a ticket if we wanted to purchase this ticket to an event. It was a four day event in San Jose, California. And it happened to be a Tony Robbins event. And at that time, I really didn't know much about Tony. I hadn't experienced him. So I didn't know what I would get out of that. Right. I know him now. <laughs> I'll just put it yeah. I know him very well. Now, now you yeah. know who he is. Okay. He said my name. So I feel pretty proud. But yeah. no, he. he I, I knew, you know, and, and I live by inspiration. I really do. Everything I do, I, I live by inspiration. If I feel driven to do something, I do it. I take action. And I knew that, that was a lot more expensive than I really was able to handle at that time for that ticket. And 
it was going to be during a week of rehearsals, which would really be a problem for me because I would have to be in San Jose for four days. Right. But inside, I knew I needed to be there for some reason. So I purchased the ticket and I rearranged my schedule and I went to that event. And when I left that event, I knew three things. I knew that I needed to let go of my teaching career after 16 years. I needed to walk away. I knew that I needed to focus my life on love and connection. And I had an intense desire to become free to give. And with that, I received clarity of what that meant. And I'm writing a book about this. I'm coaching it. I'm, I'm living it. It's what I call the five freedoms. When you have the freedom of health, which has to be first, health is always first and most important. I've learned <laughs> through that experience. Um, when you have the freedom of health, the freedom of time, location, purpose, and finance, you can create your optimal life. And you can create a life that allows you to become free to give in all areas. You're free with your time. You're free with finance. You're free with your purpose. You're free with your location. You can go wherever you need to go to serve, right? So you're free and, and you've got your health. So you're able to do those things. So when I reviewed those thoughts after, after that event, um, I made the decision one month later at the end of the year to step away from teaching. And yes, I still perform. I still conduct, but I'm not a full-time teacher anymore. And I haven't been since that moment. Um, when I let go of my career, I figured, okay, I've been through this health journey. I've been board certified and certified and certified in multiple things. I can become a global coach and I can help people in health and life. And maybe, my, maybe that's my calling now. Maybe I've had a shift because I know music was my calling. I know it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the gifts are there. But this was a moment in my life where I needed to make a pivot. And I did. And as I dove into becoming a coach and promoting myself, I realized as much as I knew about technology, and I did, I loved technology, and I had learned a lot, but I did not have the marketing skills that I needed to do a global business. So I knew I needed to invest again. So I invested again, and the next four years I spent with the industry leaders learning about how to build sales funnels, how to do social media marketing, how to do other aspects of digital marketing, and it led me into Pedro Adeo's world of challenge marketing, which was the new industry. Now, he is the person that has been hired by Tony Robbins, Dean Graciosi, Russell Brunson, Les Brown, and many others to restructure their marketing strategy using his framework and model. And when I stepped into his world, he opened up an opportunity to become a certified challenge consultant which is where we got connected. Right, yeah. And I felt driven, I felt inspired that I needed to do this for some reason. So I said yes, and I was one of the few that did get certified. I spent three years almost every day with he and his team and time in his home being trained. And it was an incredible opportunity and gift, you know, and it's now has allowed me to not only coach in health and life and music, but now I can coach in business and marketing. And so um, it, was, it was a gift. And I didn't realize, I didn't really see what the purpose of it would be other than helping me with my marketing, but it's way beyond that. And now I understand. Um, right. While I was in that, that marketing training journey, <laughs> I was putting myself out on social media as a coach. And I had a young man from Kenya find me and reach out on Messenger for help. He was in desperate need of help. So I got him on a Zoom call, and I, I asked him to share his story, and he did. And he said he was a 24-year-old, he was an only child, and he had gone to serve a two-year mission in Sierra Leone from Nairobi, where he lived. And when he left on this mission, his parents were killed. Hmm. His extended family were not of the same religion, and they blamed him for the death of his parents because he was serving a church mission. And they cut him off. They wouldn't take his calls. So here he is stuck in Sierra Leone on his mission. His parents have died. He has no connection to family. 
he made the decision to honor his mother's wish of staying and serving his full mission, and he did. He stayed and served his full two years. And when he returned home, all he had was a worn-out bed sheet and two worn-out suits that he had been wearing. And he found that his uncle had sold his house and all of their belongings. Everything was gone. And I'm, I'm guessing he didn't get the money from that. He got nothing. Right. He got nothing. And there's a lot of other stories beyond that that I won't get into those parts right now. But sure. it was tragic. <laughs> it's tragic. Yeah, it is. And he could, so he comes home. He has no education because they lived in poverty. They did have a home, which was a little above most in that area. But he lived in a poverty area. Sure. So he didn't have a home. He didn't have a bed. All his clothes, everything was gone. He had no food, no job, no education. He was really stuck. And he had been living on the streets trying to survive for eight months when he found me. And this young man has a heart of gold. He would spend his days at the orphanages taking care of all the children. He just served people. That, that whole eight months that he was struggling to survive, he was giving of everything he had, which was himself, for these other children who were left without family. So I knew I needed to serve him, and so I helped him get an apartment, and together we designed a business that he wanted to create, that he could do for the community there, and give him some self-reliance. We got him into his online schooling, and he was able to get a three-year scholarship through BYU-Idaho, which he's doing online right now. And he also has now been awarded a scholarship in Kenya. And he's going in the health field. Amazing, amazing young man, bright, very smart. And just gives everything he has to give. And it's beautiful. As I was coaching him, it was in the end of January of 2022 is when I received inspiration during that session that I needed to start a global operation, a global foundation right now. I needed to just do it. And I knew in that moment, my name was going to be the Lori Lundin Foundation, the tagline bringing nations together in service, in unity, and in love. And the process was reaching out to the one in their unique need, serving individuals, families, organizations, helping them meet the need, helping them become self-reliant, want to give back. I knew in that moment there was nothing there was no restriction. I could serve anyone in any need. I wasn't going to be put in a box where I could only drill wells or where I could only feed orphans or where I could only um, provide for educational things. You know, I, it was going to be reaching out to the one in their unique needs, serving anyone with love, no matter what religion they are, no matter what their beliefs are, no matter their circumstances, if there was a need, I could serve them. And two days later, I was, I was at a veterans dinner serving, helping there, because I do that all the time. And I met a gentleman, and I was telling him about this global foundation I was about to create. And he had a connection to a consultant for nonprofits. So he had me on Zoom with her the next day. And she became my consultant. And one month later, I, beginning of March, I was official 501c3. And I took off to Scotland to meet a client. And then two weeks later, I was in Africa for three weeks. Came home for a couple weeks and went right back to Africa again for another three weeks. And I have hugged and served thousands, thousands of people that are now family for me. That were well, when you, and we've talked about uh, you and I. Uh, I've talked about me going, and, you know, I could take my wife. And we could go to Kenya with you and kind of see the things you're working on, the people you're working on. I, I've thought about, uh, you know, obviously I'll just take my phone camera, but video, using video to kind of tell the stories of different people and see how these uh, kids are living and the kinds of work that you're doing. And I just, I was just, as we are talking about that just now, I was thinking, I wonder how many other families would love to take a trip with you, you know, to Kenya or some of the other places that you serve and see what you do and contribute and help out. And I mean, that would be pretty cool. So you had like a, a service travel service. I've, I've, yeah, I've actually had a few people mention they would like to go when I go. Now That's I awesome. want to say something because what you see on the news, when you see the large organizations go in and they dump boxes mm -hmm. of stuff and they leave, you know, it, that's just delivering the stuff and they leave. That is not the way I do it. <laughs> yeah, right. What I do is I hug every one of them. I tell them I love them. As I hand the kids a treat or something, I, I give each one of them their own item. You know, mm -hmm. I, 
it's very relationship building. I know these people. I have talked to every one of them. I have told them I love them. And when I was, you know, when I was up in Uganda, up in the mountains, I was sitting in a mud home up there. And I was about to go and speak to about 100 children and some adults as well were in there. And before that, they wanted to feed me dinner, right? So I'm sitting in this mud home and all they have is a, like a couple of plastic chairs. They have no furniture. They have no possessions. They have nothing. Right. They cook on a fire in a pot and have very little food, right? So we're sitting there and having dinner together. And, and I said to them, I said, you know, it costs a lot of money for me to travel here. I said, would it be better that I use that money to get you clothing and food and medical care and education, the things you need? Mm-hmm. And they looked at me and they said, no. They said, you being here is so much more important to us. Hmm. And that is the love I felt the entire time as I traveled between countries, as I walked the street of the slums, as I sat in their mud homes. Mm -hmm. They were so grateful and so appreciative of me just putting myself there, being there with them. And, you know, letting them know they're valuable, that they cared about, that they're loved, that we're equal. Those are things they don't ever hear or believe and feel, you know. They have so much faith and belief in prayer, but they lack hope, they lack light, they lack opportunity and resources, you know. And it's just, it's beautiful to be able to be that light, that -hmm. person that they can now have hope because they know you, right? And it's just been a beautiful journey. It's it's really a yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about that, too. I mean, when people are looking at um, fundraising, I mean, a lot of times I think about things like these big extravaganzas and they're trying to raise millions of dollars, and that kind of, which would be awesome. I mean, if we could raise a million dollars for your foundation, that would be great. But I think what's important to understand is it doesn't take a million dollars. I mean, $5, $10, $20 can go a long way when you're talking about serving people in Kenya, for example. Uh, I remember you were talking about needing some amount of money. I don't remember. It wasn't very much, but to send 30 children to pay for their books and education so they could go to school for a yeah. year or something. And I don't remember how much that was, but it wasn't very much. Well, it depends too on the level. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the food itself is actually really a lot cheaper than you would expect. Um, school supplies for, for some of the teenagers to get them into school to pay their fees and all their supplies is about two hundred dollars for a a full term but yeah for the teenagers but for the younger kids it's less expensive and Mm -hmm. um like for example on the food with with paying for an orphanage say you've got a hundred children in an orphanage or children's home they call it Mm -hmm. to pay for a hundred kids to eat and survive for a month is less than three hundred dollars Right. Yep. For a yeah, month. Maybe. Right. You know, they're eating rice. They're eating basics, but that's what they're used to having. And that's survive. It's survival for them. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So it, it's really, and, and yet these kids go four or five days with nothing. Mm-hmm. They go without food. They have no food. They have no food. There's nothing. Yep. And yep. many of the orphanages, not every one of them, but, but many of them have no adults there. They're just a place where kids are dropped off that are deserted. Mm -hmm. Their parents have died or their parents can't take care of them anymore and they put them out on the streets, you know, and then they're just taken to these homes and they just stay there and live their life until someone helps them get an opportunity to get out of it. You know, I think that's the most amazing thing I heard was that these children's homes have no adults supervising. You just have kids trying to take care of kids with no money. And and they don't have facilities. They don't have beds. I'm sure they don't have separate rooms and bathrooms and beds and i mean we have to you have to understand what does that place look like when you walk in to the to those orphanages it's pretty shocking sometimes Mm -hmm. and in uganda some of the kids they live on the land like there's one one of our children's homes they have about a hundred children and it's an older lady who's blind she and her husband have this mud home they have a couple of little mud homes on this plot of land and they have given this land to kids that had no place to live. 
And so they're, they're packed head to feet on the floor by the rice and beans, you know, on the, on the floor, just trying to scrunch them in to get them a place to lay on their mud floor. That's where they sleep. Right. And some of them don't even get to sleep indoors. They don't have the ability to. So, I mean, it's unbelievable until you're there and witnessing it. It's just mm-hmm. unbelievable. Now, over these couple of years that we've been doing this, we've been blessed to save over 350 individuals through either malaria treatment, typhoid treatment, uh, getting life-saving surgeries. We've saved some burn victims. One lady in Pakistan and a gentleman in, in Kenya were burn victims and were suffering for a long time before they could get any treatment because they had no money. It was, it was right. tragic. I mean, right. burns all over the body, severe. But they wouldn't and, and again, treatment. not that much money to treat. No, no. No, and, and, and they suffered for a long time because they didn't have that little bit of money. Um, we've yeah, also so. rescued a baby off the street. She was a six-month-old. We were able to get mm-hmm. her into a home that loves her. And mm-hmm. uh, we provided almost 30 burials. And each of those have incredible stories, impacting villages. Right. It's just beautiful. We rescued just recently 277 orphan children who were in a children's home in the slums. And it was, it was flooded. It was a river. <laughs> The river went right through their home, and 19 kids died before we found out. 16 of those 19 were unclaimed, and so we buried those 16. And we rescued the other 277. We dug trenches to rechannel the water away from their home, and we pumped out the water from the home so that we could get it dried out and livable again for those kids to be able to go back in there. And now we're caring for them. We're, we've taken that on. Um, now, when you say we, tell us a little bit about who the we is. Because I don't, did you fly down there for that? Or did you have people there already doing for that? For that one, no, I didn't fly down for that one. Um, okay, and I think that's important to note is that it doesn't mean that you have to get, you have people in place to help. Right. It's just about having the funds and the money to help. them. The young man that I, that I saved at the beginning, Habil, mm-hmm. he mm-hmm. has become my global operations manager and my manager for Kenya. He is incredible. He is, in, right. he is the one with six teenage boys that, I, that we rescued. They have joined our forces, right? They have joined right. our team. Those seven went in and pulled out the 277 children. They organized digging the trenches to get the water away. They went and got the pump and, and pumped out the water from that home. Mm-hmm. They, they got the food and, and fed, cooked the food for over 800 of our 1,100 children that we provided Christmas for, that we provided a meal and a beautiful game day, and uh, it just was, it impacted the whole community, what we were able to do. It was beautiful. But they're the ones doing that. They're the ones going into the children's home and taking care of the kids, helping get kids to the hospital. Habil is the one that took care of all the burials in Kenya. Even when he was dealing with malaria himself, he was dealing with burials of kids that died from malaria. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that when you said we saved 300 people, you don't just mean we saved them from not eating for a week. You, what you meant was you saved their life. And saved their I life. think we look at malaria, too, and it's uh, there's there's a big problem with malaria. There's thousands of people that suffer and die from malaria it's in the area. But to no save way. one person, to give them that shot so that they don't. And the other day you were talking about how sometimes they have to get it multiple times because they'll catch malaria over and over and they need a shot several times. But how much is that shot to save that child from dying? $65. Right. And let me tell you about my first burial. Yeah. When I was there the first trip, I met a young boy. He was 11. He, was, he lived in poverty. He had a single mother, a little brother that was six. They had no food. They had no money for rent. They were struggling but he was going to have a chance to play soccer. Mm-hmm. And so I was going to support him and help him. In two days, this is after I came back here, in two days he died of malaria. Killed mm-hmm. him in two days. We didn't know in time. Now, wow. he, he lay dead in that one-room apartment for four days with his mom and brother because she had no money to bury him and move the body, and she couldn't throw him away in the trash can. That was her only option. Right. Can you imagine throwing away your child in the trash can? Right. This and, is, and, that, and that does happen. They have to. They have no option. Mm-hmm. 
So four days he laid there dead with them. And when I found out about it, so we provided his burial. Which again is not U.S. burials. We're looking at ten thousand dollars. No, no, it was about three to three fifty, three hundred to three hundred and fifty dollars to take care of his clothing, his the coffin, transporting mm-hmm. the body to the village where he was going to be buried, which impacted that entire village. They <laughs> this brings tears to my eyes. There's an eighty-five <laughs> year old man that lives in that village. I have never met him. He has right. my picture. They they all asked for my picture because the foundation is my name. They wanted to know right. who I was. Right. He has that by his bed, and he says when he sees that picture, he sees the light of Christ. Just because of the burial we provided for this young boy. Right. Now, when he was being buried, the mother passed out. She was taken to the hospital and diagnosed with HIV. Oh, my gosh. Devastating. At the same time, the little brother, the six-year-old, got malaria we got him into the hospital to be treated. Mm-hmm. So he was in the hospital during this funeral. The mother's right. taken in, diagnosed with HIV. The boy, we saved the young boy, the six-year-old, James. He got home. Two days later, the mother committed suicide. James found both of them. Mm-hmm. Now he's left alone. So I go back to Africa and I meet right. James and I take him out to dinner and I get him some fun things. And when we were at the restaurant, we were, we were just waiting for our driver afterwards. And I looked across the parking lot and I saw a little girl. She was about nine and she was crippled up. She was sitting on the side of the parking lot alone and she was crippled. She was super skinny. She had blood in her, coming from her mouth. She was very, very, very sick, deathly sick. Mm-hmm. And so I walked over to her and of course I didn't realize at first, but everyone in that parking lot and shopping area had turned and was watching me tears because they don't see that there. Everyone's in poverty. Right. So I walk over to her. I give her a treat that I had in my bag and I said, you look really hungry. Let's get you some food. And she comes and follows me. She could hardly walk. She was so crippled up and her arm was crippled. And so I asked Habil, my guy, right? My 24 year old. I asked him to take her in while I watched for the driver that we'd already called for, get her food, find out where she lives. And so he did that. Um, He got her food. She took it home to her single mother and little sister who was also deathly sick, Hmm. which we didn't realize at that time. (laughs) And he went back and found her again. And then he went to their home in the slums. When he got to that home, there was nothing. It was a little shack in the slums. You know, the shacks, if we could only imagine, right? Unless you've been there and seen it, we don't really realize how bad it is. Right. They had no beds. They had no stove. They had no toothbrush. They had zero. They had nothing. Mm -hmm. They had two girls who were deathly sick and a single mom who was not well. Shortly after that, little sister dies. Mm. So we provided her burial. She was my second burial. And we took this mother and this little girl I found, Cynthia. We took them and got them in an apartment. We got the mother a business going. She wanted to do beadwork. She has a beautiful gift with jewelry making. And so she's thriving with her, her business now. That's great. Her daughter, we got medical care. She's the top in her school. She's never had education, but she is the top student in her school. And she's all well now because she's had the medical care. Yeah. We were able what about to the crippling, the, the, the crippling? She's okay. She is perfectly okay. fine now. She was just deathly ill. She was very, and, very and now nourished and hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, that's kind of how we work it. We find and are driven and led to people specifically that we need to serve. And Habil is the same way. He'll find people that we need to serve and we will bring them into our fold. Right. And, um, you know, we've I was saying we've got those that we've rescued and saved. We've, we've provided thousands of children with medical care, food, water, clothing, school supplies, school fees both in orphanages and, and individual families that are in need. Um, we're building a library and learning center in Pakistan for children to be educated over there. Mm-hmm. We are um, working on building a training center in Uganda for single mothers because there's a hundred plus, I mean, there's way more, but we have a hundred that we know of um, single moms that are having to be ladies of the night. They're on the streets because they have no education, no job opportunities, and they have family, they don't, they don't know how to provide, right? 
Right. So this will allow them to be trained in sewing and beauty salon work and we'll be able to help them create businesses to be able to sustain their families. We have um, a soccer club in Nairobi, Kenya that started with a handful of orphan boys. And I sent you the video. I hope, I hope you got to watch it. I don't know if you did. But um, we have just a handful of orphan boys at the beginning and it's now over 80 boys and girls. It's impacting the entire country of, of Kenya. They are in first place on the leaderboards for the Football Kenya Federation in the league standings in three age divisions and have wow. held that for over six months. Nice. It's just, it's blossoming. We're opening girls teams now because there's so many wanting to come in. And these are kids that are either orphans or they're in poverty. They're on the streets. They, they don't even have shoes to wear. When they're practicing, they're in Crocs or sandals, most of them. Right. Uh, often don't have food and now they're beginning to have a family unit in the soccer club and they're learning life skills they're getting interviews they're getting scholarships they're getting invited to play internationally and they don't only they don't only win championship but they win certificate of fair play most disciplined team most valuable player top scorer in you know, all the age groups it's just right. so beautiful so beautiful yeah. the impact they're making on that country everyone knows our foundation name over there it's it's right. um, that big and it's much to do with with our soccer club and what they've done it's beautiful They're let's um, go back a minute to you talked about the woman in pakistan who had been burned what what was her story and and what did it take to get her well you yeah. know i have pictures that are sent to me of all these things right she was sitting by a little heater in her little home and you know how they wear the long gowns, the drapey kind of gowns, mm -hmm. caught on fire mm. and burned her entire body. It was all blistered up all of, all over her body. She was a 70 year old. Mm. She had been laying in critical care for over a week. They would not treat her because she didn't have money. It took $200 to get her the surgery she needed. Right. And to be treated. $200. And she suffered for over a week like that. Right. There was a gentleman um, like that. He was 71 in, uh, I think 71, in Kenya just recently, a couple weeks ago. He had, he had an arm that was paralyzed, and his legs both got scalded, burnt severely. Mm -hmm. But because he had no money, he couldn't get treatment, and it started rotting all the way into the bone. I have pictures. It's horrible, horrible. Right. suffering, agony, the pain they went through, both of these, these people, beautiful people. We got him treated and he's now thriving. He's now doing beautifully. But the suffering they go through and until yeah. someone's there to help. Yeah. There was, there was a young boy in Uganda. He was about an 11 year old. He, they were playing, the kids were playing and he fell out of a tree. Mm. Now these kids are not nutrition, you know, they don't have the nutrition to be strong and he got internal bleeding from falling out of this tree. They called me up. He was in the hospital, but the doctors wouldn't do anything. And while I was on the phone, he died because he didn't have the money figured out before they wouldn't treat him. Right. And, and I asked my guy in, in Uganda, who's another one I've saved and his family. I've, I've, I've provided and taken care of them. Um, I said, what do they, what do you do when these kids get, get like this because they die they have no choice there's no option you know it, unless I'm there to help care for them. one of my little boys in Uganda he was five he's now probably six I've treated him for malaria six times in a year right which is meaning getting that shot every time and it was $65 to treat him mm -hmm. but they have no protection they have no repellents they have no nets they lay on a mud floor. They have only a one shorts outfit until it wears out. They have nothing else to wear. There's nothing protecting their skin from the mosquitoes during the rainy season, and they get it. You know, it, it's just, it's tragic. It's tragic. It's the number one killer over there. And yet it's so simple to take care of it if we can, you know. It's, it's just unbelievable that they're having to live that way, you know. And it's just, it's beautiful to be able to be part of making a, a difference. And I, and I think about this a lot. In fact, most days when I wake up, I'm in awe that I get to do what I do. But I'm like, 
had I not said yes to that inspirational moment? And had I not prepared myself by taking those pivots when I was sick, you know, when I shifted my career, all of those pieces have led me to where now I am using all of the skills in health, music, life, business, marketing, as I coach people and serve people in poverty around the world. Every one of the skills I've been given were given to me for that purpose. And, and when I came away from that event and I knew I needed to focus on love and connection, mm-hmm. for the past six years, I have focused on love and connection. And that is what prepared my heart to say yes to all of this. That is what allowed me to love people the way I love people now. Mm -hmm. It is so different than I did before. It's not even, I mean, when I got that inspiration, I was like, why? Because I loved people. I really thought I loved people at that time, but it's nothing like I do now. And the connections, and it's for the purpose of this foundation. So tell me where you see the foundation in like five years i see us growing to other countries i see us growing to other countries i see the soccer club expanding out to other countries and maybe even other sports Mm -hmm. i see us having um, built an orphanage in in for sure in kenya but also maybe in uganda that is going to have and i've already designed this i've already got the guy to run it in kenya i've already got the person trained Um, it's going to have not just a a, a nice facility for these children, but it's going to have another section on this land that's going to be a kids club and educational center library where they can have resources for homework. They can be trained. They can Mm -hmm. get educated. They can have a library resources. They can learn music. They can learn sports. They can learn art, have those opportunities that these kids don't have. You know, at the beginning of that soccer video that I was telling you about, it talks about the joy that these kids had when they first got the first ball I sent over to them. They had never had a real ball. Hmm. And to be able to kick and play soccer with a real ball was massive for them. Right. And to get custom uniforms, we can't even understand. I mean, our kids, it's so, it's so just everywhere, you know? Yeah. These yeah. kids, that's a dream that they right. do they would ever experience and, and they're living it now and it is right. changing them so much you know and same with the children in the orphanages just knowing that somebody cares that somebody's there for them yep because they have nobody else right one of my little boys in kenya in the orphanage i found out that when he was well, let's see he was three when he was i think one or two, he was found on the streets. He had been deserted by his family. So the police dropped him off in this orphanage and he's just been living there. My teenage kids have lived there since they were little Mm. with no education, no opportunity. And yet when I get them education, they skyrocket to the top of the class. Right. They do not take it for granted. They are so appreciative. And if I were to ask the kids, and I did this in Kenya, what would you want if I could get you something for Christmas? They wanted paper and pencil. Right. Not right. treats, not movies, okay. not games. <clears throat> yeah. Paper and pencil so they could learn. Right. They isn't wanted that, isn't that just remarkable? I mean, it's just is. incredible the difference that, you know, <clears throat> yeah. And for the price of an Xbox, you could feed an orphanage for a month. <laughs> you know, you could keep probably home. every child in there, you know. Right now, I just had a meeting with my group over in Africa um, yesterday, actually, and I found out that there's an uh, there's another um, children's home that's down the river from the ones we rescued, mm-hmm. and co- cholera is becoming prevalent there. Yes. It's killing. I mean, they they found almost forty children dead there. And they had four hundred um, and it's like four hundred thirty six children in that home, mm-hmm. and just the other day almost 40 of them were found dead and they're dying every day. These kids don't have food. They don't have clean water. They don't have ability to clean themselves. If they get wounds, they get infected and die. I mean, there's nothing for these children and people in poverty. They have no help and no resources. 
And, it, and it's amazing how you're how you have set up the organization so you're just like on the ground with these individuals looking for people who need help. It's yeah. it's not that you're just doing some kind of drop of food somewhere in a food bank. I mean, you're literally tracking down separate individuals and families in need and making sure they're getting the things that they need, which I don't think a lot of organizations do. Necessarily. No, I don't know of any that do it this way. It's yeah. very different. But like I said, I was inspired to do that. And I, and I know this is the way it needs to be. And it's, it's just really, it's beautiful to be able to see these people. I mean, even that mother and little girl that I saved and got them into an apartment and helped them, they now help. They help cook for meals for the orphanages when we do special days of dinners and things like that. They come and help. So they're That's all great. kind of coming together. And like Habil, he's, he's my leader there. Um, they go out, he, he and my six teenage boys, right? They go to the hospital. They, they did this on their own. They told me about it after the fact. They actually got some t-shirts. So they were matching as our team. And they go into the hospital and they clean the building. They clean the facility. And for that, in return, the hospital is giving them mosquito nets to take back to our orphanages so the kids can be protected nice. for free. You know, right. they're doing work. So those, those people on the ground in all of the countries mm -hmm. that I have, they are doing so much work. They are going out, they are finding resources, they're finding donations, all that they can in the poverty areas that they live, right? But they are working so hard to take care of these things and to find the people mm -hmm. that we need to serve. And mm -hmm. we work together to make those things happen. So, and, and, you know, when it comes to getting money over to them, I do it directly to my managers and then my managers go and buy the items and they take them in so that they're delivered directly to the people. It's not just throwing the money out to whoever needs it. It's, right. it's very done through the management teams. And, right. and that's beautiful because then we have those relationships. We get to right. know the people we're serving, which is so important. We get to see their need and make sure that we're meeting the right needs. And that's what I do when I'm over there. I get to know right. everyone we're serving. I make sure that I know what their needs truly are so that we can serve them best and help them get out of their situation. Well, I'm excited to go down there with you. I, I think it'd be great if other families, you know, could come down with you and kind of show and yeah. have a, even if it's a time to, I guess, learn about what you do, but also to work maybe a little bit, to, you know, if there's things that need to be done around the orphanage. If we get the know. funding together, some of those projects that I'd like to do would be great to have help down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're building yeah. garden spaces, agricultural farms and training centers and and we're building the orphanage and the and the children's center next to that. I mean, all of that's going to take um, resources. And once we have the resources, mm -hmm. we'll dive in and start doing it. And so that would be amazing to do a trip where we can kind of put that together and make those things happen. Um, wow. When I when I go, I'm also planning to do a boot camp for the soccer club to let the kids get nice. trained by some people here. And I'm also going to be um, hopefully opening our first tournament that we will host. So these kids will have the opportunity to now be the host of a tournament, which is really exciting for them. Um, but yeah, it's 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 just been amazing. When I was in Uganda, they had me speak on the radio station and in the villages and different churches and different communities and just, it's just spreading light and love. Right. You know? And then you can learn and see and, and know exactly where the needs are. And my goal is as I open all those other countries and I can, I can name them all for you if you want to hear them all. There's some, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. But as I open those, I plan to travel there because I want to know who I serve with and who I'm serving. I want to know them directly. I want to build those relationships. And I think that's important um, that right. we do that. So. so tell me about the little girl in the photo on your website. Um, first of all, what is the website? Oh, Lori Lundin Foundation. The Lori Lundin Foundation dot org. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Landon. If you're yep. confused about the spelling. Yeah. The Lori Landon Foundation dot org. Okay. Yep. So. Um, yeah, that's the site. And the little girl at the beginning that's praying. Mm -hmm. In the classroom, she's like... She's my little... sweet little girl, yes. She is one of my kids in Pakistan. They are trying to be educated. Mm -hmm. 
they didn't have any resources. We, we have a gentleman who is doing this. He's been trying to do this all, all along, trying to work and do it, but he doesn't have the resources available either. And so he, and he lives there, but he takes care of over 50 children, and he's trying to educate them. And so we talked and decided that we would build a foundation library and learning center for these children. And I need the resources to, to build it. I have only gotten a little bit for them so far, and I feel bad because there's so much I want to do for them. And these children just want to be educated. They want to learn. They need paper. They need pencils. You know, they need, we just got them some little chairs and tables because they were on the floor. They had nothing. And so we're, we're working to eventually build a beautiful library and learning center there when we can get the funding together. But we're just gradually adding resources so they can at least continue learning and, and just build on that. And so she's one of those children in my library and learning center in Pakistan who is uh, praying for an education. She's praying for an education. And they do pray. They pray for me all the time that we can help and make this work for them because they have no one to turn to. Right. No one to turn to. And so it's beautiful. And that's another trip I plan to take very soon is to go to Pakistan and, and be there in person. Um, I haven't yet gotten to go there, and I'm, I'm excited for that journey. I would love yeah. to meet these beautiful children. Yeah. And the so little Lori boy, Lundin, Lori Lundin Foundation dot org. Yes. Dot org. I'll make sure there's a link in the description so people can go and visit that. But yeah. I'm uh, I'm excited to take this podcast and put it out there. First of all, as a podcast, but also I want to take um, little snippets of the podcast and add in some of the images and video that you've sent, so that you know, kind of help raise awareness and let people know about what it is that you're doing. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. I just received a few more pictures from Pakistan and Uganda and Kenya. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the videos that I have. And I'm putting some of those up on the website as well. Um, yeah. But you're welcome to any of those that you'd like to use. And, yep. and you're looking for corporate sponsors as well, other businesses that can... Yeah, I'm looking for business partners and sponsors. In fact, on my website, there's a page called the Giving Heart Partners. It's a recognition page where I honor anyone who's donated in different tiers. I honor the recurring donors. Um, if you'd like your name on there, you know, you, you're one of those people, then I can put that. If you don't want your name and it's okay, I got mm -hmm. anonymous on there as well. So, right. uh, but I'm, I'm really trying to build our support team. And the other part of that is the business partners and sponsors. And that is businesses who love what we're doing as a foundation and want to align with us as one of their charities of choice, like you, Rob. And, uh, <laughs> So I'm highlighting, I'm highlighting these businesses and I'm going to be promoting in, in, in a way to give back. So for their support and their, and their love and their, their recognition and trying to support us, I'm, I'm giving back that way. And so I'm putting a section where I highlight all the businesses that are partnering with me so that people can go to that page and say, okay, this is someone who's charitable. This is a business that has what I need and they're charitable and they're part of this foundation. And I love that about this, you know, cause some people like to work with giving people. Right. And so yep. this will give that, give that recognition and honor that they are, they're partnering with us and I'm going to be promoting them as much as I can. Um, there's also a testimonial section where some of them have written testimonials and that's also going to be shared in my social media. And I'm trying to get their word out so that they can not only build their business, but just to, to honor and, and acknowledge my gratitude for, for whatever it is they're able to help support us with. So any amount is, is greatly appreciated. You yeah. know, I have a link that allows you to do a one-time donation, or you can set up a recurring donation in different frequencies. You could do annually. You can do monthly. You can do weekly. However you want it to be and whatever amount you want, yeah. it's very customizable. And so whatever, I mean, anything. And, and like I've been saying this, past few weeks since I've been talking a lot about this page is this is really the greatest gift I can give yep. to be able to be a part of something that, that is so massively impactful. It's right. global. It's, it's, it's changing. And like you said, it's saving so many lives and there's nothing better that I could give someone than to be a part of this. Right. <laughs> I live it every day and I'm so grateful. Yeah. I'm so grateful. Yeah. So 
to share that out is really important to me. And I would love to speak with anyone that has questions, anyone that wants to be a part of it in any way. Um, I would love to do a Zoom call with them and talk. Well, I will make sure that we have links in the descriptions and places that uh, the ability for people to contact you. I'll get whatever contact information you want and I'll put that in there and then That's great. I will uh, do my best to promote even just this podcast that we're doing. Yeah. Uh, promote that, you know, even, you know, like on Facebook and YouTube and things and try to get people aware because I think it's just such a great organization and I'm looking forward to, like I say, you know, going down there. Uh, that would be so fun. In Kenya and learning how to, so fun. learning what you do, seeing what you do. And uh, it's it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. I, I'm a little, uh, we're, we're, we're out of time. I'm a little sad about that. I know you have another appointment you have to jump into. But I just want to say thanks again for taking the time, telling us the story, talking to us about. It's been a long time coming that I've been wanting to have this interview with you. So appreciate yeah. your time on that. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. I appreciate you letting me do this. And Perhaps in the future we can talk about the events, and that's another opportunity for people to jump in and be a part of supporting. Because I give back through the through the events as well to the foundation. So that would we'll be make sure we have um, some information in there about those events that you do, and just you know, give us the quick elevator pitch on those events. Um, I just I, two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I have an events business now that I am I am holding benefit tribute concerts and other performances across the country where we get to enjoy incredible music by professional groups um, and different types of performers, even magicians. Um, and they are doing it as a benefit for the foundation. And so at, what I do is I get to speak about what the foundation is and introduce it to the people that are there. And then with the proceeds, after all the expenses are covered, with the proceeds, I make a, a, a large donation back to the foundation so that this is a way that I can spread awareness and I can generate funds that can be given back to the foundation to serve people in need around the world. And like I said, including the U.S., we serve here as well. And, and it's just, it's beautiful to be able to dedicate my life to serving people. It's just beautiful. Yep. So if you, uh, so those watching or listening, if you know any places that would host an event where you could have a tribute band come in and be entertaining. And, like a high school theater. Um, high school theaters yep. work perfectly. Yep. Then I would love to uh, have you contact Lori on that and see if there's some ways you can get your school or public event um, arena, <laughs> yeah. for lack of a better word, to to reach out to her and let's try to get some of those events booked. I think it sounds like a, it's a lot of fun and it's a great way to, to learn more about your business and donate to that cause. And I, Again, I think it's just amazing that you're doing this. I love the fact that it's so hands-on that, you know, the money that people send in are going directly to these children and saving lives and feeding kids. And I think that's so important to note. So yeah, thank, thank you again for your time. I'll let you get on to your other call, your other meeting. But um, thank Lori you, Rob. Lundin, thank you. You're awesome. Okay. I will talk to you a little later. All right. Thanks so much. You bet.